All right, so thank you all for joining us. Um, I wanna give you a little bit of background as to how this all started and the reason that we are never gonna discuss anything related to COVID. Um, but around, um, I would say April or May, Eileen and I were texting each other about how miserable our existences were. And we decided that that might be more of a uniform experience. Um, so we invited a number of our friends, including Karen Brazel and, um, and Clay Berlew and, and others. And it morphed into a group of five and then a group of 10 and then a group of 25 and then a group of 87. And now it's a group of a hundred and change. And what was interesting, um, aside from our kvetching about COVID and, and the difficulties in trying to maintain general surgery uh, during a pandemic, um, was that a number of topics came up that uh, were kind of uniform across, not just women, because I hear it from my male provider and my male colleagues as well, but across um, junior and mid-career people about how to do things differently, do things better, grow their career, advance, etc. cetera. Um, so while our little group is called Women in Trauma Surgery because the, the initial groups were trying to get together to keep our wits about us, and that's, that's how we got to uh, Women in Trauma Surgery, we're more than happy to invite almost anybody who has um, interests in some of the stuff that doesn't really get talked about, mentorship, sponsorship, um, how to navigate difficult situations, et cetera. And we had presented a, a session around um, this topic to the all uh, trauma level conference in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia last year and again this year, um, and really wanted to uh, branch off through the support of the AAST to a larger group and have some symposia that are not hard science, and but are very, very important to those of us who are in this field. Um, so here we are. Um, this is our inaugural group. Thank you all for joining us. Um, Eileen is going to present Breaking Through the Gra Glass Ceiling, and then we'll, we'll give you a little teaser about what's to come. Um, I believe our next conference is going to be in January. They will not always be on Friday afternoons. As a matter of fact, we're going to try to avoid um, always being on a Friday afternoon. We are also going to have random time points because we are uh, trying to uh, bring our international colleagues in because what we experience in the US is, is very similar to what's experienced across the world. Um, and we're going to go, that's kind of our plan. Anybody who has any suggestions on topics, anybody who has any suggestions on speakers, um, we are going to invite our male colleagues to join us and present because they have some insights that are similar um, and gender blind. Um, and we'll go from there. So welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us. And I'm going to turn it over to Eileen. Excellent. Well, thank you, Kim. And, and uh... Really excited to see you all. And I think as we watched this sort of grow organically, we were really impressed with the international participation. And at the All Levels Trauma Conference, we had some really great sessions where we had representatives from many different countries uh, talking about these issues. So a lot of these issues are universal, but there are certainly unique challenges. And I think we can help each other as we move along. So to sort of kick us off, I was asked to talk about leadership and trauma. And I really, um, I wanted to talk about this, you know, this concept of the glass ceiling, which has been actually a, around for a while, and 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 talk about kind of where we are and what progress we've made, uh, and maybe where we need to go. It's interesting if you look up the history of the term the glass ceiling. Um, there's a couple of different origins, but probably the one that's quoted most commonly is from uh, the 1978 Women's Exposition in New York. A woman named Marilyn Loden, who worked for the New York Telephone Company, was uh, sort of a last minute sub at the meeting because her boss was supposed to give a talk on how women were, were to blame for barriers that prevented them from advancing their careers and couldn't show. And she was kind of inserted into this panel. And in this panel, she took a contrary view. And she said, you know, there's a glass ceiling. There's, there are these invisible barriers that actually prevent women from being promoted. And, and that that is probably the origin of the term, although there's some debate about whether there's a couple of women at Hewlett Packard that also came up with it at the same time. 
But in any case, uh, it really got people's attention. There was some news media around it. And over time, this concept really worked into the mainstream. And in 1991, the US Department of Labor launched what they called the Glass Ceiling Commission, which was focused not only on women, but also on underrepresented minorities. So what are the barriers to people who are you know, doing well in their career uh, to really getting to that next level? And you know, do we still have a problem with this? Well, if you look just sort of at the business community data uh, in 2020, women accounted for about 55.9% of the labor force, uh, but only held about 29.9% of the chief executive positions. And if you look at even larger companies like Fortune 500 companies, women currently lead 7.4% of those, which is a lot uh, more than before, but still a lot less than, than the representation in the workforce. Well, what about in medicine? I think you've probably all seen this data. We all know that uh, right now around 50%, um, some would say a little bit over 50% of medical students are women. Uh, the number of general surgical trainees have been increasing over time. Uh, this data uh, from 2016 was, was at 38%. But as you get into academic medicine, uh, you know, the numbers at, at, at rank continue to uh, to fall and, you know, currently around, you know, 10% or so of full professors. But that's increasing, I think, as the number of people coming into our field are increasing. And if you look at the data on the right, which compared 1994 to 2015, you know, we've made progress, right? Going an assistant professor level from 14% to 25%. Um, you know, at the associate professor level, we've increased the full professor level nearly triples. Um, but if you project out how long would it take to reach 50% of women, which is representative of people coming into the field, you're looking at you know, 49 to 121 years. So there is some work to do to try to uh, accelerate the process. This is not a unique problem to the United States. And because we're an international group, I, I wanted to look at some international data. This is data from the United Kingdom. Uh, which looked at the, the percentage of women uh, consultants, consultant is their term for attending, uh, in surgery. And in 1991, it was 3%, and in 2016, it was 11%. So again, a dramatic increase, but pretty small percentage, certainly lower than, than uh, we might see uh, overall. And then if you look at the breakdown by subspecialty, and in the United Kingdom, trauma is kind of lumped with orthopedics, and we know in the U.S. as well, that the numbers, number of women in orthopedics is quite low. Um, but you can see across the board here, the percentage of, of women in, in those different fields is, is overall relatively low outside of pediatric surgery. And then I think we have to remember that there's, there's wide uh, variety of challenges in countries around the world based on their culture, uh, based on, uh, on the society that in which people live. And I had the wonderful opportunity to visit Pakistan right before COVID uh, struck. Uh, this is the surgical interest group and in, among the medical students there. Incredibly energetic, incredibly bright group, um, you know, really motivated to pursue surgery, but they face a lot of challenges. And I had the opportunity to meet with the AWS chapter in Pakistan, who recently published a paper um, uh, in the World Journal of Surgery just this year. So they note in that paper that 70% of the students who enter medical school in Pakistan are women. So more than even in the United States. But 50% of these do not practice or pursue a specialty training. And that's because once they get married, they're often not allowed to continue their education or to continue to work. Only 14% of surgeons have completed training since 1967 are women. And they did a nice survey of 218 surgeons, 67% from Pakistan, 33% from high income countries for a, as sort of a comparison group. And interestingly, more of the women in the high income countries reported that they experienced gender discrimination during medical school and residency. They speculate that that may be because the Pakistani women just thought that was normal <laughs> behavior and didn't report it. Um, but they noted that the, that the Pakistani surgeons were more likely to suffer a family-related interruption to their career, uh, higher rates of gender discrimination and bias impacting their job satisfaction and difficulty in, in establishing mentoring relationships uh, with men, and also significant difficulty in interacting with nurses. And 56% were told they could not become a surgeon because of their gender. So I think uh, we have challenges that, that we don't even appreciate, uh, those of us who live in 
the United States, um, but we need to be conscious of those and, and figure out how we can help uh, raise all our boats. So what are the barriers? I think uh, you, you all know that we have some challenges with our hierarchical training structure. Uh, certainly there's the uh, uh, problem of implicit bias. We have the challenge of trying to balance our lives and all of our responsibilities, uh, which uh, I like the term work-life integration rather than work-life balance because we really are uh, trying to make it all work um, and not sacrifice either side of our lives. And then of course we have challenges with burnout. I think the other thing that, uh, and if you haven't seen this talk by Caprice Greenberg, I would recommend it. It's on YouTube. This was her presidential address at the AAS in 2017, where she talked about sticky floors and glass ceilings. Uh, you know, glass ceilings imply that, that their barriers are at the top and, and you just can't quite get through them. But sticky floors says that there's, there's things that are actually holding people down as well. Uh, and there's great uh, literature on this, and I'm not going to go through all the studies, but, but there's been studies looking at women getting uh, fewer and smaller NIH grants than men. And if you do blinded reviews uh, uh, based on gender, you get very different uh, reviews sometimes out of study sections. Uh, early career investment can be lower in women uh, uh, when they're hired. There's clearly a salary gap that persists. Um, it, that uh, ranges uh, depending on the estimates, but somewhere around $44,000 a year in academic surgery is what's most recent, recently reported and even higher in uh, private practice. And when they adjusted for all the factors uh, that might contribute to that pay gap, uh, years in rank and, uh, and all of that, they still uh, came up with about 40% of that gap being unexplained. Uh, we have uh, challenges with implicit bias and violating what people would consider agenda schema, making it sort of difficult to interact. And then I think we still have some challenges with imposter syndrome that we have to deal with ourselves. This uh, is a great website. If you haven't uh, tried this, you, you can go on it for free and you can take your own implicit bias survey. And uh, it's pretty striking, I think, that most of us uh, have uh, biases that are very similar based on how we were raised uh, and brought up, whether we're a man or a woman. So if you look at this particular one, this looks at the association of uh, male with career and female with family. And uh, you can see that overall, uh, there's a fairly strong or uh, moderately strong uh, automatic association that's kind of ingrained in how we think. And if you do these surveys online, which are so these rapid fire questions, you'll see that uh, you'll probably fall out in a similar way. And that leads to challenges. This is a, the term speaking while female is from Caprice Greenberg's uh, talk. Um, you know, that's an excellent suggestion. Perhaps one of the men here would like to make it. I think uh, this is a problem that people have in just sort of navigating uh, in a meeting, uh, being heard and being respected. And uh, again, it comes from a, not a place of conscious bias often, but implicit bias. So where are we headed? I'm actually really optimistic because if I think about our profession and what I've seen just in the, in the 25, 30 years that I've been in this field, um, I see a, a groundswell of women coming up in our profession in acute care surgery. When I interview for fellowship now, when I interview for jobs, um, there, there are women far outnumber the men. My next year's fellow class is gonna be all female. And that's, that's an incredible pool of talented people. So I think there's a groundswell of people coming up uh, in this profession. And I think the other thing that I'm really excited and encouraged about is that there's a recognition of this issue. And there are a lot of men who really have worked hard to help pull women up in this field, the he for she concept. And I, I see Andrew Bernard on here as one of those men, but there are many others in our field. Um, you know, who have really said, you know, this is an issue, we want to be involved, we want to help. Uh, and I think that has really helped uh, raise uh, the awareness and uh, helped advance us uh, through some of those glass ceiling challenges. And I think the other thing I think is we individually have to think about is that why do we seek leadership positions, right? It's, it's not, it's not to, to just put more work on our plate because we could easily do that. I think if you think about why we seek leadership, most of us go into this profession because we really want to make an impact. 
right? We want to take care of our patients. We want to see them get better, but we also want to improve the system so that their outcomes are better, right? So that we can uh, improve whether it's the trauma system that we work in, whether it's the um, community, whether it's our own profession, what can we do that really um, has an impact? And that's, and that's the point for, for seeking leadership opportunities. As we look for leadership opportunities, then I think we have to decide kind of what is the scope that we're looking at. So there's lots of opportunity. If you, if you step up and want to help uh, uh, in your hospital, in your healthcare system, they will, they will put you to work. Uh, you can have leadership opportunities in your own university, certainly in your own local regional trauma system. Um, and then, of course, there are national and international professional societies, which can be incredibly rewarding. So I, I encourage my younger faculty to, to start locally, just to look for what, what is it they can do within the hospital that makes a difference? What is it they can do within the local trauma system that makes a difference? Build relationships that way, get experience. And over time, they get more and more involved in the national and professional societies. And I, and I think we're blessed with a wide array of professional societies um, uh, in trauma and in uh, burn and in uh, uh, basic science that supports that, the shock society, the surgical infection society. Really, you can find a professional society home that fits your academic interests. And I really encourage people to do that. Uh, you can't do everything. You can't go to every single one of these meetings, uh, but I think you should you should explore them and then pick you know two maybe maybe three, uh, but but two that you really feel this is this is my academic home, uh, and and get engaged and get involved and uh, and the benefits of that uh, at least from my perspective have been uh, really tremendous. Uh, you. Um, build relationships, you start to network, you realize how small this field really is, uh, and you make a lot of friends along the way. And that's a great way to identify mentors and sponsors as you move along. So, so I can't say enough about the importance of getting engaged in professional societies. And really, if you, if you look at most professional societies, what's the path to leadership? It's involvement, it's engagement, it's being part of the process, it's contributing to the organization that gets you recognized. Now I did, I had the opportunity to give the Orion's uh, lecture at East uh, go and, and, and one, this is, this is one of the slides from that talk, but also probably my, the, the figure in the journal of trauma that I'm most proud of. Uh, and that is uh, this penguin figure that, that looks at our sort of natural life cycle in our professional organizations. And I think most of you can probably resonate with this. If the first time you go to a meeting, you go usually with a mentor, um, maybe you're uh, presenting a paper, you're, you're in the you're research resident or something like that. Uh, so you're in that first picture there, the little penguin, and you don't really know anybody, but if you stick by that mentor, you know, kind of get through it. Maybe the next time you go, you're looking for a job. And now you're going to start talking to a lot more bigger penguins, but you're still um, really don't know anybody and don't feel like you fit in. And it, it really takes, I think, several years before you really get on a committee and start working, where you start to get to know uh, your peers. And in my experience anyway, as an introvert, that it takes probably 10 to 15 years before you're in a big crowd of penguins and you know enough people to really feel comfortable. So I think you know this is, this is the way it works, but we should do better than this. We need to accelerate this process because there's so much advantage uh, to building these relationships that we need to work within our organizations to figure out how can we make this better. Well, one way is mentorship and sponsorship. And uh, uh, you all have heard these terms. You know that mentors advise you and guide you throughout your career and sponsors nominate you for key positions uh, and promote you to others. I think equally important are mentors. Uh, that's where he or she frequently comes in, but also peer women mentors. Uh, who can really give you advice in your career as it advances. And as women, we, we, we have to recognize that in the current structure, we, we, have, we need men to mentor us. <laughs> we can't expect that we're, all our mentors and our sponsors are gonna be women. And these are just some of my key mentors in my career who have really um, you know, been there for me and, and helped me advance and, and all of them are men. 
But I'm also optimistic that we have uh, cracked the ceiling at, in leadership at just looking at uh, the leadership of the professional societies right now. So we've had women in leadership in the past, no question. Um, some societies have been much more proactive than others, being, I think, one of the pro very proactive societies. But if you just look at this year, the top line here, both the presidents of the major European societies for trauma are women. The president of the ACS is a woman, the president of the Western Surgical, the president of the American Burn Association. And next year, Patricia Turner will be taking over as the executive director of the American College of Surgeons. That's really historic. Uh, a historic event. And then uh, Dr. Stein and I are, are both president-elect for EAST and AAST. So, so I'm excited that I think that there are women in leadership that can serve as mentors and sponsors for us. So what about our approach? What, what can we do as individuals to try uh, to make a difference? And, and I have one of my peer mentors is Dr. Stewart, uh, who uh, is the chair at San Antonio. And he gives a great talk on mentorship where he talks about the seven P's to be. Uh, this is also what I use when I do the orientation for the Committee on Trauma, because uh, I, I think if you're gonna be um, effective in that organization, this is a great approach as well. So his seven P's to be are pretty straightforward. They, you know, participate, you know, raise your hand and get involved. Uh, keep the patient at the center of your discussions. Uh, be a problem solver. How can we promote a culture of yes? Rather, you know, it's one thing to complain about things; it's another thing to come with a solution or a potential solution. Think about how we focus on improvement. Be passionate and patient at the same time, which is extremely hard to do. I see Kim nodding her head there, but very important. And then be perseverant. And so, I really like these seven P's as an approach that I take to heart when I think about a, a new project. The other book I love, and I, you know, people always talk about books and these things, and you're like, I gotta read another book. This is a really quick read by Adam Grant uh, called Give and Take. And Adam Grant's a professor at the Wharton School of Business. He talks about sort of relationships in the workplace. Um, and he talks about this concept of givers, takers, and matchers. I think we all know takers. Takers are people who, uh, who will only help you if it benefits them. Um, and we know those people and we don't wanna hang around with them. Uh, but most of us are matchers. Most of us think, you know, I'll help you and down the road, you're going to help me. And, and that's how it works. Um, but there is a subgroup of people who are really givers uh, who, um, you know, will help people, even though there's no direct return to them. Uh, and that, and that tends to be how I think a lot of women in, in uh, academics focus. Um, it can be problematic in that you can help people so much that you don't, uh, take have the time to advance your own career and so this book talks about being an other focused giver uh, which allows you to be a giver and still um, not burn out from it so I I would really encourage reading this book because I think it, it helped me in thinking about you know how I interact and 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 what how I want to interact in the in the workplace I think the other thing that uh, we have today that we often don't think about is a lot of opportunities for for professional development. Uh, you can go so far as getting an advanced degree, um, but there are lots of other programs that are short-term programs uh, that uh, you can get scholarships to attend, the Health Policy and Leadership Scholarship, uh, which is offered through the American College of Surgeons in partnership with a number of professional organizations is a great way to go. Um, you can get uh, training at the ACS Leadership and Advocacy Summit, which is every year. You can get travel scholarships to go to that meeting. Uh, there are a number of leadership courses, there are grant writing workshops, there's, there's programs specifically for women in medicine. I've not done it, but I've heard great things about the Executive Leadership and Management Program, or ELAM. Um, you can do media training, personal coaching. So I think it's a little bit on us to, especially if we're introverts and not comfortable, uh, you know, in a, in a big crowd or in a leadership position, to take a little bit of this training to help, help us advance in our careers as well. And and I would encourage you to look for these opportunities. And it's amazing to me how much uh, is available uh, through our professional societies that people just don't even know about so they don't take advantage of. So surf the websites and you'll, you'll learn more about those. Finally, I was talking to a very good friend of mine, uh, 
just a couple of weeks ago, um, and, you know, about this talk and what I'm going to talk about. And, and she said to me, well, you know, I just, I never wanted to be known as a woman surgeon, just a great surgeon. And I think that probably all of us feel that way. Like I, we kind of wish we didn't have to have women in surgery groups because, um, you know, if you, if people qualify you as a woman surgeon, is that something that's negative? I, well, I think it's a positive. Um, and I think that uh, it is on us to recognize that even though we've got maybe gotten to a leadership position, that survivorship bias, in other words, I made it so you couldn't probably make it too, uh, is not, is not, is not the way to lead. Uh, we really need to shape the path and help uh, those that are coming up uh, in, in our profession uh, uh, obtain the opportunities that we have had. And I think it's okay to be a role model. Again, I think there's a little bit of imposter syndrome when people say you're a role model and you don't really want to be one. But I think we need to get okay with that because that's how we're going to advance as a group. So Kim talked already about the WITS group. Um, uh, we're very excited to have you join us. It is an international group. It's open to everybody. It's free. Um, our plan is to have quarterly webinars uh, with the interactive discussions. So this one is kind of a kickoff meeting, but we have designed it, as you can see, so that uh, you can interact with us. And we, whatever time we have left, which we, looks like we'll have some time, uh, we would open for discussion and we would welcome your feedback your thoughts on future topics uh, for discussion. Uh, we are supported by the American Association for the Surgery of Trauma, and we're very grateful for, for that group for taking us under their wing, but you don't have to be a WAST member to belong. My slides are changing on their own, which is sort of mystique, mystical here. Um, and so to join, it's really simple. You just send an email to this email address. Uh, Althea Jones, who's on here from the WAST, is helping staff it. Uh, she'll add you to our list. As, as Last time I checked, we had 188 people already on the list, which is really terrific. I, maybe we're over 200 now. I don't know. Althea will have to tell us. Um, but uh, uh, this, we're here just to try to advance this cause and, and, and create a community. And I think we have a tremendous community. I put this slide together a few years ago. You remember when Twitter was uh, hashtagging, I look like a, a surgeon. I made this, I look like a trauma surgeon slide for that. Uh, these are just friends of mine across the U.S. There are obviously many more people that I that can't fit on this slide, um, but uh, pretty much everybody here has been part of WITS already, um, and we welcome you to join us. I think, uh, again, incredibly energetic, diverse group, uh, really motivated to, to help advance the field. So I'll, I'll wrap it up with, you know, I think what can we do as individuals? We need to identify our own passion, figure out where we want to contribute, where we think we can make the most impact, then identify our mentors and sponsors and seek out people to, to serve in that role, um, get engaged, volunteer for projects in, in our organizations, remember the seven Ps and the giver approach, take advantage of opportunities for professional development. And together, our, my goal, our goal, I think, is that we clean the sticky floor and then we pull everybody through the glass ceiling. So that's where I think we are. Again, I think we've made a lot of progress, uh, but there's certainly more to do. I'll end there with one of my heroes. Um, and I'll thank you so much for the opportunity to share that with you. And I'll turn it back to Kim, who I think is gonna lead our discussion. But thanks again. And uh, I guess that's all I have. Kim. Thanks, Eileen. Uh, great. Great presentation as always. Um, I would like to reemphasize uh, the Brandeis scholarships that are available through um, WAST East and the American College of Surgeons. Um, I had two faculty members go through um, the Brandeis scholarship last year. One of them has now signed up for one of the Brandeis MBA programs, um, found it phenomenally helpful. So certainly something that is open to um, kind of the, the later career assistant professor, mid-career associate professors and a great way to grow. I think the other thing that is phenomenal at the associate professor kind of moving towards um, the professor level, and I will tell you that every woman chair has gone through the ELAM process. Um, so it's, it's a huge pipeline. Uh, Julie Sosa speaks phenomenally well of it. 
Uh, my own chair, Nita Huja, went through the program and, and learned a lot um, and really helped her migrate from a division chief at Hopkins to the chair of surgery at Yale. Uh, talk about breaking a glass ceiling. The old boys school now has a woman in charge of the department of surgery, um, but certainly a, um, a great opportunity. Our next um, panel, but I don't really want to talk about our next panel because I don't want to terminate this one without a little bit of discussion, will be leadership and trauma panel discussion. Um, Kate Martin from Australia, um, Deb Stein, who uh, is returning to the Maryland uh, Shock Trauma Program, Krista Kalps, who is on the Council of the American Board of Surgery, and uh, Jamie Coleman, who, as you all know, is phenomenally active in social media. We'll be talking about some of the challenges in their careers and how they overcame them and, and how to really ask for help. Because my favorite slide, which Eileen didn't use, is a great picture of a turtle on a fence post. And I will tell you that every time you see a turtle on a fence post, you know they didn't get there by themselves. There was somebody helping them. So what, what Eileen and I are hoping that this group will, will allow um, individuals to do is to identify the people that can put them on a fence post or really help them to, uh, to build their careers and help you to overcome what any, any obstacles that you're, you're encountering. Eileen's dog is barking in the background. She has a very vigorous puppy. Actually, that's the overhead paging system. Oh. It barks too. <laughs> Great. So uh, happy to open this up for discussion. Please let us know your thoughts, what you want us to, to bring forward in future meetings, any questions or comments on what you heard. This is, uh, this is for you guys. And uh, Andrew, any thoughts? Uh, for those of you who did not see uh, Andrew Bernard's East Presidential Lecture, um, it was iconic. Uh, it's available on east.org. Um, and I would encourage you to look at it. Hi, Andrew. Uh, uh, hi, Kim. It, it, you know, the first thing that comes to my mind is that uh, my talk is already irrelevant because there has been so much progress just in these uh, you know, about to be three years. So um, it, it's amazing. The, the session uh, yesterday, the, the WST Grand Rounds, uh, or two days ago, uh, the Modern Family. Uh, just one more example. So um, thanks for giving me a moment to say something, but there's amazing progress happening. Thank you. Other comments or suggestions or things that you need that you want to hear? Eileen and I are obviously happy to, to support individuals. Hi, Dr. Davis. Hi, Dr. Folger. Um, good to see you, Dr. Folger. Uh, I just have a quick question. In terms of um, students and young interns or residents that may be coming up in the field, uh, what words of advice do you have for them in terms of gaining mentorship and cultivating um, leadership um, themselves as they're uh, growing into the field? Yeah, I can start. I think, uh, you know, I think the principles that we've talked about apply absolutely to students, to residents, to fellows, as they do to faculty. I think, um, you know, the, the key is to uh, identify your passion and surround yourself with people who are going to really help you reach those goals. So as you move through training, you want to look for training programs that are going to support you. Uh, they're going to help you um, advance your career and uh, and build relationships and and have mentors that will that will continue to support you over time and and just get to know people. I think I've met a lot of uh, medical student residents that that come on scholarships to the leadership and advocacy summit or come to the East meeting or come to the AAST. All those meetings give out travel scholarships. You know, it's been a little weird the last couple of years because of all the virtual meetings, but I think there is opportunity to, to come even as a very young person and start to meet people, get a feel for the group um, and build relationships that way. Kim? So, and I, I think you're not always going to identify, you know, you're going to have a couple of, of um, 
false starts, right? You're going to think that somebody is going to be a great mentor for you, and you're going to find that for whatever reason, you don't necessarily mix or mesh. Um, and that's normal, right? The other thing that I'll say is that there are people who will be your mentors for life. Um, Eileen has Ron Mayer, uh, actually, who I also have tapped into. But for me, it's it's Bill Chaffee, it's Tim Fabian, it's it's Martin Krauss. Um, people that, that you can talk to. I mean, I, I remember having a devastating outcome and calling Bill Chaffee at 2.30 in the morning. The man answered the phone and talked me <laughs> off a ledge. Um, so uh, you, you will find people who are going to support you throughout your career. Um, you will also find people that are kind of one-offs, right? So individuals who will sponsor you for things because they think that you meet the, the, the type of individual that they're looking for, but sponsors tend to be one-off relationships or two-off relationships. They don't tend to be um, relationships that, that are, are ongoing and, and throughout life. I mean, I, Chaffee for me has been a 30-year rock, basically, and I mean that in a positive way, not in a negative way. The other thing that I'd like to, to level set is, and I don't know how Eileen feels about this, but this is not a Dr. Davis, Dr. Bulger thing. This is a Kim and Eileen hanging out and having a conversation. Um, because I think until, uh, unless we break down the hierarchical barriers that we have in these types of meetings, um, individuals aren't gonna feel quite as comfortable asking questions. So one, Catherine, thank you for your question. And two, we haven't met, but my name is Kim, that's <laughs> Eileen. <laughs> I see Krista here and, and KJ is here, Kim Joseph, also a goddess, gave a great talk. KJ, what meeting was that that you gave that phenomenal talk that I tweeted about? KJ? Kim Joseph? No, oh, she's not listening. We have lost her. But Leah right. has her hand up, Kim. Oh. How do you tell? Oh, there it is. Oh my gosh, I'm being polite. Can I, can I just add that KJ is like my goddess and I will tell, I still will tell everybody because she is absolutely phenomenal. Um, and just feeding off this last, the last question, I spent two hours last night with a first year medical student who was just wanting to shadow um, and, and try to figure out what she wanted to do. And we spent most of those two hours just completely dispelling all of the myths about surgery and procedures and she was so convinced like she had to go into only ER or something else and by the end of it I had her convinced that I think she would really like orthopedic surgery and I think she should go be an orthotraumatologist and so I'm going to hook her up with with some other people but I feel like there's opportunity here to start really early like maybe pairing with AMWA or something like that with medical student chapters to really get that message out about what who we are, who you can do, because we're still hearing the same stuff of, well, I wanted to have a family or I wanted, you know, like, you can't do this or the hours are weird. You know, like, like academic trauma surgery is only one thing, but even that as has been said, you know, you see one call schedule, you've only seen one call schedule. Mm -hmm. Like everybody has their own, own setup. So I feel like there's, there's a lot of stuff and I, I'm so very grateful for this group um, but I think we, I think we need to get that word to the trainees super, super young because they're spending years hearing all this stuff that's just not true. We can do it locally. Um, we can try to do it at a more national level, but I think uh, local efforts work extraordinarily well and I totally agree with you. Um, the rumors are still out there that you can't be can't be a mom and you can't be a surgeon or you can't be a decent dad. I still remember one of my partners who, two physician family, called me and he said, "I'm in the middle of a case, but I've got to leave. My kid's sick and my wife can't get there." And I'm like, "Okay, well, I'll, I'll scrub you out." You know, that's what we do. Um, so I don't I don't think it's just a gen I, I don't think it's a female gender issue i think it's it's more of a everybody thinks it might be difficult to have a family i see kicker hello we have, Rochelle. We have another hand up kim oh do we yeah ashley. i at this but i see ashley uh, with a hand up ashley you're up. <laughs> yes hi <clears throat> Uh, thanks so much for starting this i appreciate the discussion i wanted to ask a bit about um you brought up avoiding the survivorship bias um which is something that, you know, recently I feel like given how 
kind of much more open this conversation has been. It has sort of asked people to um, be more open about, you know, their experiences and be more, um, should I say, you know, kind of speak up when, when these things um, happen. And sometimes I feel like that enhances the survivorship bias that you're talking about, right? You know, saying things, bringing things to people's attention that you think would not happen to a man, which at least at my, you know, institution in terms of the thing, the initiatives that they're trying to accomplish is sort of a, an approach that they've taken um, and makes me sometimes question the, how useful that, that is to sort of, I mean, it's one thing to, you know, stand up for yourself, but it's another thing to kind of make a martyr of, of yourself, which is what I hope to avoid, so. <laughs> I, you know, I, I think there is a fine line, uh, and maybe Rochelle wants to comment too, and I, Calps is here somewhere. Um, I think there is a fine line because you, you want to you wanna advocate for yourself or you want to advocate for your colleagues, but you don't want to be perceived as, as kind of being a whiny bitch about things, for lack of a better word. Um, and that, you know, some of that is, is the implicit bias of the person who's listening to you, and that requires a little bit of education. But I think as long as everything is couched in kind of matter of fact terms and, and the emotion is left outside the room, um, I, I don't think it will feed into the, the, the um, I, I don't think it'll make women look bad. Um, I also think that we as women have to support other women. And I know women can be very, very harsh towards other women. Um, but I think that it's it's really important to support each other and and to uh, to interact. Some of my best friends are on this call, people that I feel absolutely totally comfortable calling with issues because I know they'll understand. And if they don't understand, they'll at least it, uh, listen. Unless of course I call Rochelle, because then she'll take me skiing and throw snowballs at me. <laughs> don't know if I answered your question, Eileen. You probably have some thoughts or Rochelle no, or. I think we should hear from others too. I, I, I see Rochelle took ourselves off mute, so we'll hear what Rochelle thinks. I think I think that Kim can take a snowball throw to the back just fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, I uh, I just want to mention one quick thing. You made me you made me think of this, Ashley. Um, recently, there was uh, there's a woman in the Department of Medicine who didn't feel like she was getting a fair shake um, as far as, as moving up to the associate level. And, uh, and she reached out to me um, because she didn't feel like she had an ally in the Department of Medicine. It's, it really is important, man or woman, to find allies in, in places where, um, where you can get the help, like at the level of an Eileen or a Kim. Um, who can move, help you move the ball forward and, and other allies. And that critical mass, um, now that I'm at an institution where I have to think about those things is really, is really important. Um, so finding where those alliances are for getting to that next step, um, because what I, what I was able to do is, is talk to the Dean about getting this person on the docket to be considered associate. So it's, it's important to understand your landscape and know who you can turn to, because I can guarantee you that person had turned to someone before you a generation ago. How, how do you find somebody like that, that you're going to advocate as you're going through? Is it just you go and see, okay, who's, who's a female at a level higher than you and just sort of cold column or like, it's, it's hard. I feel like, especially, I mean, we've got some interdisciplinary stuff, but I guess it's hard to kind of like, how do you actually develop that interdisciplinary relationships? Yeah, I, I would just start, I'm sure my, I'm sure people have different ideas about that. This one happened serendipitously and I felt like at both institutions where I've been a, a um, faculty member that it was just, she knew me because we had a really tough COVID ECMO patient and she was pulmonary critical care person. They ended up on our ECMO unit. We bonded over that patient. Um, so I, I find it's not very helpful as far as an algorithm, but um, I find that those serendipity things that happen um, are, can really be helpful and, and, and you can really take advantage of them. Yeah, 
I, I think you look for people that are approachable. You know, I, there, there, there are going to be people who you approach and they're, 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 it's, you know, it's not their thing, right? They're too busy and they, and they, and they won't be there for you. But, but it doesn't hurt to approach people. It doesn't hurt to cold call. Um, I, you know, I, I think sometimes people are honored by the fact that you ask for their advice. You know, <laughs> so. Um, I think it depends a little bit on your landscape, but I think you can find those people. And sometimes you just have to be there long enough. You, you know, if you're at a new institution, it takes a little bit longer because you have to figure out the politics of the institution. But um, but once you've sort of been there long enough, you can kind of get a sense of who's approachable and, and who will willing to to talk with you, even if you're you know from a different department or a different group. And I also wouldn't discount the guys, right? Um, a lot of guys are amazing sponsors and mentors for women. I, you know, the the generation of, of women that I grew up with, most of our mentors and sponsors are male because there weren't any women. Um, so the women may be harder to find, um, but they're probably out there. Yeah, that was sort of my point with that one slide. I mean, again, I think we 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 should not think that we can only be mentored by women. <laughs> Yeah, I would be a that would be a mistake. Yeah, I think I saw Tanya raise her hand. Hi, yeah, thank you so much for this. This group uh, is phenomenal. And it's nice to see where, uh, you know, how you guys have forged the way. My question is, um, given that you've been inter, you know, been very active in the international arena, how do you suggest connecting with people in different countries? I'm Sri Lankan. And I've, and every time I go back there, it, you, you want to be sort of culturally sensitive and, you know, I, I grew up here and so that I still find, you know, although I am Sri Lankan, it's difficult to sort of connect in that way. And what what is your, you know, both, both with the men and with the women physicians in other countries, sometimes that's challenging. Any tips for that? Yeah, I think surgeons are surgeons wherever they are. That's been my experience. Um, and I think if you are, you can do it through an organization that has, um, you know, international groups, branches, chapters, like the American College Surgeons has international chapters, right? The Committee on Trauma has international uh, footprint. Uh, so you, if you're working through a group like that, then you meet people that are within that group in that country. The AWS also has chapters mm -hmm. uh, really all over this. I, you know, I was, it was in Pakistan for a totally different reason, but the AWS chapter was like, oh, you're here, come and come and talk to us, you know? So I, I think um, you start, you can build relationships by looking for those sort of organized groups of surgeons um, and really a surgeon is a surgeon. Mm -hmm. so, so you have an almost automatic connection on that level. Thank you. I, I see Tina has joined us. Hi, Tina. It must be the middle of the night, Tina. Not completely in the middle of the night, <laughs> almost. S sick in bed, so not very visible on the video. But but nice nice to listen to the to the discussion. Yeah. So so for those who don't know Tina, Tina is uh, is an awesome trauma surgeon from Norway, mm -hmm. and uh, president on on that slide. I think I had for uh, IATSIC, right? IATSIC, yes. So, yeah, so welcome. And, and Tina I, I led some great sessions at the meetings over this, the virtual meetings over the summer for IATSIC to sort of raise awareness of some of the very similar topics in Europe. Do you have any comments for the group, Tina? I, I, was, I was just listening. It, it's um, the healthcare system is a little bit different. The, the hierarchy that you're describing in the US is a little bit different. Oh God. Okay, I, I need to put on the video. I can't. I can't start <laughs> looking at my own name. You have to. You have to <laughs> bear with that. Um, no, I, I think it's 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 different. Uh, but we have the, the issues are the same, and and the problems or the the challenges for women. I think we discussed that last time on on a meeting as well. Uh, the differences with with um, so uh, shorter shorter working hours in Europe in general. So actually less challenging for women to join surgery. And we have many female, um, actually the percentage of female surgeons is increasing quite a lot, but we still see the same challenges uh, in, in how they advance, what kind of positions they get, 
um, if they get into the leadership groups. We have a flatter structure, I think, than you have in the US mostly. Um, but there are still some, some barriers that we should take down. And I'm just finished, we just finished up a week where we were, we have this um, um, one week before the medical students finish. We have uh, medical students and nursing students in the same, and they have to go through, uh, through team training. And having these discussions, most of them are women. Most of the medical students are women. Most of the, the, the nursing students are women. And they've never worked together before. And sitting down, having that, this kind of discussions with them over the last week was quite, quite uh, interesting. Uh, and what, they, what they're expecting from work life and, and so on is, was just around the, the, things, the, the topics you were discussing uh, before I joined. I think we have, we have a big job to do. I think, as, as uh, like you said, I, most of my, my mentors have been male. Uh, and I think there's absolutely nothing wrong in having male mentors and, and sponsors and so on. Uh, but I think we have a job to do, all of us, for the next generation. Thank you for staying up in the middle of the night to join us. <laughs> yes. And I'm sorry you're not feeling well. It's fine. It's not COVID, so that's, it's fine. <laughs> but it's all good. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> Can I ask a quick question? Sure, yeah. Sarah. Um, I'm uh, starting my second year um, as an assistant professor now, and I think one of the things I'm finding challenging is navigating things with mostly female residents. Um, sometimes it's personality things, sometimes it's um, supporting them when they are, uh, I don't know, maybe frustrated or whatnot with interactions, even with some of our other female surgeons. Any advice? as far as how to support these women in surgery um, and how much to, I guess, acknowledge versus um, maybe not have them focused on the gendered aspect of it. Cause sometimes, you know, the comments will be, oh, does that happen because I'm female? Is it taken that way because I'm female? And I'm not quite sure what to say about that. Cause sometimes I think yes. And sometimes I think, no, I think that's just your, your strong personality that rubs at times. Oh, indeed. Nobody wants to take that one. <laughs> I, I'm, I've been talking too much. Yeah, so I'm going to let you go first. Well, no, I, 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 think, I think you're absolutely right. It's a challenge. Um, you know, I think uh, as a mentor in that situation, I try to, to sit down and, you know, when things have cooled off and sort of relook re at the situation through a different lens and say, you know, um, you may think that this is all because of your gender, but maybe there's, there's a way you're interacting that's causing trouble, <laughs> causing friction, like you said, you know, I think we have to have that insight um, and not blame every bad interaction on, oh, well, they just biased against me in some way. Um, we have to deal with biases and we have to, we have to work with them and we have to, to certainly not accept any, any overt harassment, but at the same time, I think it's on us to figure out how we support people to to work in a collegial team-based environment, which is what we're in. If that makes so sense. I would add, um, I've spent uh, or, or lived through a number of uh, coaching rounds. Um, Eileen will tell you that I'm, I'm a different person now. God, I hope she'll tell you that <laughs> I'm a different person now and a little bit less edgy than I, I was when I started. Um, but I think that, you know, the, there's, she, she's given you your, her book. So I'm going to give you one that I think is important, which is what got you here won't get you there. Um, the, it's a book about how the type A personalities that allow us to become surgeons and become medical students and succeed in a world that, that is, is a challenging world is a very um, dysfunctional personality for functioning in team-based environments and leading teams and managing people. So that, that's my first thought. My second thought is, is something that I actually said to one of my faculty who was um, sitting in my office earlier this afternoon expressing frustration about an interaction. And my comment to, to that faculty member was that, and I've recently learned this and I'm, I'm trying, you know, we're all works in progress, right? So trying to inculcate it into how I react to things. Um, but um, 
you cannot control how people react to you and how what people say to you. You can control how you react to them. So that um, I think that particularly in the environment in which we're working, where everybody is totally stressed out by the absolutely crazy 18 months that we've been through, um, one, I think it's important for each of us to be kind to each other and recognize that whatever was said probably wasn't said in a malicious way, but two, to react to it in a way that, that we can be proud of. You know, that we can't control other people's behaviors, but we can control our reactions to their behaviors. If I can just throw in a piece of advice from my husband, and I may need you guys to vouch for me that I actually do listen to what he says sometimes that I did bring it up. But what I tend to be a bit um, feisty with gender issues. And I've been told that I maybe take it too far sometimes and I'm trying to listen and be that. But one thing he asked me to do if I say, well, this is because of whatever, it's like flip it. If this were, if the gender role were different, if a guy said this or a woman said this to a man, what would the context be? And if it doesn't fly in that context, it should not be said, right? Either way, because there's stuff that we'll do as well that we'll say and be like, oh, we, you, know, you can't do that, right? So it's, I think it really helps put that perspective to pause, flip the role, and then say, does it make sense? And does it fly? And if it doesn't, then it, it may be that and we might need to check something. That's very wise advice. You have a wise husband. <laughs> and we, we will vouch for you. Yep. I think we have to close it out, Eileen. We're, we're over I time. do. We're very, we're, we're very much at time, but, but I, I want to thank everybody because I think this is exactly what we want. We want to have a good discussion and, and we're trying to set up the sessions going forward so that they're sort of panels and, and they'll be very interesting. So I hope you can all join in for them and, um, and we'll record them. So if you miss them, you'll be able to at least catch the discussion. But this is exactly what we're trying to do. And so excited to see you all today and mm -hmm. and I uh, hope that you have a, a wonderful holiday and we'll get back together with this group in January. And then I think we're hoping that we can do something in person, maybe at the next AAST meeting for, for those that are able to attend. So again, have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Um, feel free to reach out to myself or to Eileen if you have topics that you think we should uh, bring forward or individuals that you think would be great speakers. and. Uh, have a great holiday. Be safe. Take care. Take care, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thanks.